Wouldn't it be awesome if we had to look for another campus because we just overfilled this one? Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. All right. So um, if you're visiting with us, we have been going through a series. Uh, So we started with Easter, and Easter we talked about historical things. We talked about Jesus and him rising from the dead. And, and people can wrap their minds around that and say, okay, he came back. I believe that he's Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross. And I believe that, that I can believe in the God of history, but I can also believe in the God of the future because I'm praying that when I die, I get to go with, be with him in heaven. But what many people, including Christians, say is I have trouble seeing him on a daily basis. So we've been going through this series called Every Day God. And that seeing God every day in our world, whether it's seeing God at the movie, seeing God in nature, seeing God through people. And today we're going to be talking about seeing God through prayer. Uh, Some people are what we call prayer warriors. These are people who just pray all the time. And if you, if you need something done, these are the people you turn to and say, man, I need to get you on my team. I need you to intercede for me with God. I want you to intercede for my husband, my wife, my nephew, my job, my, you know, whatever it is. You just say, I want you praying for me. And you know who they are. These are people who just seem to have a whole new level of different connection with God. And you're doing the best you can, but you think somebody's got it better, so you go out to them. So we, we have these prayer warriors that we know about. Then there's the rest of us. And, and uh, we do a really good job in praying with crisis. You know, oh, dear Heavenly Father, help me pass this calculus test that I didn't study for. Um, help my marriage, help my wife, help my kids, restore my health, my wife's health, my child's health, my father, mother, you know, whenever there's a crisis that's coming along, then you, you really know, okay, I've got nothing else to do but pray. That's, it's out of our hands. Isn't that amazing? We're going to talk about this in a little bit, is that sometimes we just do what we can do, and then when we run to the end of ourselves, we say, okay, God, your turn, step up, do what you can do, because I don't know how to do it anymore. So we're really good at praying at crises. Uh, Some people are really good about praying at meals. And uh, I've heard from Miss Pat that uh, we get a lot of community children here at our summer camp, which is coming up, by the way. Um, Summer camp is basically vacation Bible school from six in the morning to six in the evening. God bless Miss Pat and her team for all that they do. Uh, But many of these kids are not Christians. They don't come from Christian families. Sometimes we get interreligious who come from different religions, but they know that this is a great place, a safe place, and it's one of the most inexpensive in town. So they know there's a place that they can take their kids. But they teach them to pray at mealtime. And, and so we've heard from back from some of these families that said, you know, we're kind of embarrassed. We haven't been praying for our meals. Uh, but when the kids say, hey, we can't eat yet. We have to pray first. Most of the parents will oblige and say, okay, let's do that, but make it quick. We're out in public here, you know. All right, so many people pray at their meals. Some people like to get up early in the morning. Where's my, where's my morning people? Any morning people here? All right, a number of you. God bless you for that. I should have known. You're the ones that are always here early. Then there's the other people that's like, I do everything I can just to get here at 9.15, you know. You know? Um, but many people get up in the morning. That's when they like to have their quiet time, and they like to have their devotions, and they like to have their, their prayer time. Then there's others of you who are the evening prayers, and you, you pray before you go to bed. And then there are the people who pray pray, as Paul says, all day long. You pray without ceasing. You just, you're constantly aware of what God is doing and, and the world's need for prayer. And so you're constantly lifting it up. How many of you have ever fallen asleep praying? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, my little confession is I did it just this week. <laughs> I was I, I like to keep the lights low in my office when I'm working, and I'm an introvert so and ADD, so I'm always like, what's going on over there? What's going on over there? So I kind of quiet things down, and, and I got myself into a comfortable position, and I started praying and saying, oh, okay, God, what do you want us to do this week? What do, you, what do we need to hear from you? What do you want to teach us? And then next thing I know, somebody snoring woke me up. <laughs> and I startled, and I looked around, and I was like, 
since I was all alone in my office, I can only assume it was me. I, I assume it was this guy. And, and sometimes we're embarrassed when we fall asleep praying. Some of you have fallen asleep right here in church. Yeah, it's like, seriously, I have done this before. It's like, man, I'm on fire. I'm going. I'm preaching. And the whole time I'm preaching, I'm thinking, this is great, man. This is awesome. This is good stuff. God stuff and these people. And then I see a guy in the front row going. <laughs> it's like, seriously, dude, wake up. Come on. This is the good, this is the good stuff, man. I can't believe. But some of you, you never sit long enough. And when you do sit down, it's all you can do to stay awake. So we're going to give you some encouragement if you've ever fallen asleep praying. Uh, one of the other things that I thought about it was that, you know, the old children's prayer, if I should die <laughs> before I wake, you know, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Well, at least if you die while you're, you're asleep, then the last earthly thing you are doing is praying. I believe that's got to count for something. I think you get extra points for that or something. I don't know. So there, there's hope for those of us who have fallen asleep praying. Well, today our, our gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 9, and I'll be reading from verse 28 through 36. And it's about the transfiguration of, Transfiguration is a $3 word that says his appearance changed. So what's happening is it's getting close to the time where Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem, where he knows what's going to happen there. They're going to, they're going to capture him, which is ironic since he rode into town, but they're going to capture him. They're going to put him on trial. They're going to uh, beat him unmercifully. And then they're going to crucify him on the cross. And he knows this is what's coming. And yet, one of the things we can learn from Jesus about praying is he was constantly leaving his disciples behind. And he was going up a mountain to pray. He was going into a garden to pray. He was constantly setting himself apart. And in fact, he, he told the Pharisees, he said, you know what, I only do what I see my Father in heaven doing. How does he see what his Father in heaven is doing? But through the power of prayer. And so the time is coming close to where he's going to give himself up. And so he's going up on a mountain to pray. And he takes along three of my favorite disciples, Peter, James, and John. Now, Peter, most of y'all know about Peter if you know anything about the Bible. And Peter's the one who's always sticking his foot in it. He's the one that got out of the boat. He's the one that walked on water. He's the one that sank. He's the one that uh, said, no, Lord, it's not going to happen to you. And Jesus turned around and said, get thee behind me, Satan. It's like, it's, I'm not Satan. It's me, Peter, you know. But Peter is that guy. He's a man of action. And I identify with Peter. I'd rather do something than talk about it. I would rather keep busy and keep moving and be productive and let's talk about it a little bit, but then let's just do something. If it's wrong, we'll change it next week. But I'm a, I'm a guy of action, so I appreciate Peter. So he takes Peter, James, and John, and something supernatural happens. Let's take a look at our, our word for today. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus, and they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I just have to say something about 
This is not in my notes. I'm making this up as we on the fly here. Um, it's interesting to me that this passage in Luke says the disciples kept this to themselves. Okay, you're on a mountain. You see Moses and Elijah, and you're not going to tell anybody? I don't think so. But if you flip over to Matthew and look at the version in Matthew, it says Jesus asked them not to say anything. I still believe they have to tell somebody. Come on. But Jesus said, wait until I've come into my glory. Then you can tell people about what you saw here. So here we have this passage about this transfiguration. Uh, we have Jesus going up on the mountain and he, his appearance, that's transfigured. It, his appearance changed and, and he, he glowed. And this is one of the cool things that can happen through the power of prayer. Remember when Moses was uh, off in the desert and he was praying, he was gone so long, the people thought he was dead. And when he came down from the mountain, he was glowing so much that he had to put a veil over his face. It was too bright because he had been with the Lord. Here's the power of prayer. Prayer changes everything. It can even change your appearance for the better. It can make your clothes look cleaner, whiter, and brighter. But your whole appearance, the Shekinah glory, enwrapping all over you can happen. Supernatural things happen through the power of prayer. And in this incredible so I, we, we're not told exactly how the disciples know that it's Moses and Elijah. But if you, if you know anything about the timelines, Moses was lived about 1,500 years before Jesus. This is not normal. Dead people aren't supposed to come back and they're not supposed to be seen, and they're not supposed to talk. And Elijah, he lived 800 years before Jesus. He was seriously dead too. Well, we don't actually know if he was dead because he was taken up to heaven in a chariot. So some say he never actually even died. But it's not normal for people to live for 800 years. So you can already see, man, there are some incredible supernatural things that are happening to prayer. Now, I promised you uh, that I'm going to make you feel better if you've ever fallen asleep before. Peter, James, and John, these were some of Jesus' favorite. In fact, in just a little while, he's going to take them with him again to the garden. And guess what they do in the garden? They fell asleep again. If you had just seen Moses and Elijah, do you think you'd be falling asleep? It's like, come on, guys. And yet, Jesus knows how human we are. The mind is willing, but the body, the flesh is weak. The heart is there, but our bodies get tired and we fall asleep. I'm telling you, if you've ever fallen asleep, and if you fall asleep tonight, there's no better sleep than sleeping in the Lord. And there's no better sleep than, than falling asleep while you're praying. Now, here's the other thing that's really interesting about this. Remember, it's about Peter, and, and Peter is all impetuous, and he's a man of action. And basically, let me give you a paraphrase with what happens, okay? So, um, kind of like me in my office this week. Uh, they're, they're trying to pray with Jesus. They're trying to hang with him. We don't know how long he'd been there. And then suddenly, they're like, what? And then all of a sudden, it's like, Oh, and this is where it's okay to use it. Oh, my God. You can't use it any other time. But when you're talking about Jesus, it's okay. But it's like, this is not normal. I see Jesus. And I'm assuming that Jesus told them either that or they had big name tags. You know, Moses, you know, hey, I'm Elijah. You know, good to see you. Uh, so we don't know how they knew. But here's what the paraphrase says. Peter didn't know what to do, so he spoke. How many of you know somebody else that's like that? <laughs> you don't know what to do, so you just start talking. I don't know about you, but, and I'm sure Peter later would have said, you know, maybe this would have been a good idea. We have Jesus, we have Moses, we have Elijah. They're in the house, and they're glowing. This is not normal. Maybe I should just be quiet and listen and pay attention. 
maybe something really cool is going to happen. But I don't know about you, but I, I have felt that power and presence of God before. And I have felt like oh, I didn't want to move. I went into freeze frame because I felt, it's kind of like if the Lord's here, then I can't move over here because he might go away. And literally, I've been walking across the parking lot and then felt the Lord come on me. And I was like, Ugh. and And I can imagine that's, that's what Peter was feeling. is like, hey, this is something special, but these guys are leaving. They're going away. I don't want this feeling to end. And, and so he doesn't know what else to do. And he says, hey, it's good for us to be here. This is really cool. Let us build shelters for all you guys. And that way we, you can be protected. God bless Peter. He was always the first one to step up and want to do something. But you can just see the purity of his heart. Some of you, when you were kids, or maybe you have kids, and, and you know there's one of them that seems to always be tripping over themselves, but they just have the pure heart of gold. And that's what I think of Peter is, man, poor, impetuous Peter. He was always excitable, but he became the leader of the church because he was willing to step out on faith and to be active. So what happens in the power of prayer? Power of prayer can change everything. Supernatural things can happen. You can even get your glow on. But many Christians, they struggle with prayer. Why? And, and it's one of the, the secret sins, if you will, because they always assume that everybody else is hearing from God. I'm, I'm going to remember the old timey phones that had the like connections and the cords and all that kind of stuff. And so that's what this is. I'm going to use the, you know, hello, God. Yes, uh, it's Greg again. I want to talk to you. And like, hello, hello. So, ah, this thing's dead. That's what some people feel like when they're trying to talk to God. They feel like somehow the connection is cut off between them and God and it doesn't work at their house. But maybe if they talk to somebody else, they've got the line to God and they can talk to God. And part of the reason is because we misunderstand what prayer is really all about. Most of us treat prayer more like the vending machine. You know, we've got a vending machine back there. How many of you remember putting quarters in a vending machine? Yeah, some of you remember putting dimes in a, in a vending machine. And you, you put the dime in, and then you get what you want out. And, and then sometimes, have you ever been there before where you're putting the quarters in, and the quarters keep dropping right through? And, and then suddenly you're, you're licking them, you're rubbing them on your pants, you're trying to figure out just the right order to put them in so that you can put it in to get it right so that you can get it out. Well, today we have a dollar vending machine back there, and so you can see people just getting out a dollar out of their pocket, and they're kind of rubbing it, and they're making it flat, and it's like, does it go this way, does it get this way, and you go, woo! You know, it's like, oh no. It's like, anybody got another dollar? This one's not working, you know, and I've, I've got to try to figure out to get the right combination so I can get what I want out of it. Is that not how often we treat God? Well, there's no sense in praying, He ain't listening. He didn't do what I wanted Him to do. I've tried praying on my head. I've tried praying on my knees. I've tried praying in the backyard while I'm driving. All this kind of stuff. And it doesn't work. My line's busted. It's broken. But sometimes it's because we fail to understand what prayer is really all about. People, I don't think there's as many atheists Others, as there are angry theists. They believe in God. They're just mad at him because he's not taking care of them. He's not providing. He's not doing what they want him to do. He didn't give me my, the husband I want. <laughs> or sometimes you got the husband you want, and then you, then you want the transfiguration. You want something else. You want something different. He didn't give me that hot girl. He didn't give me the job promotion. He didn't give me the Mercedes Benz. He's not a wishing well. And I think James hits the nail right on the head when he says in chapter 4, 
You have not because you ask not. Sometimes even Christians have just flat out stopped praying because it doesn't work. God doesn't do what they want him to do. Or James goes on and says, or you ask with wrong motives that you might spend what you get on your pleasures. Wow. That's a game changer, folks. When you begin to understand and begin to ask that question, wow, maybe I've not heard from God because I'm asking the wrong question or I'm failing to ask at all or maybe I've got the wrong motive because I just come to God when it's an emergency. Many of us just come to God when, when we've tried everything else, done everything I can do. I guess we'll turn it over to God now. Isn't that where we should start? But listen to this. Prayer isn't about getting what you want. Prayer is about building an intimate relationship with your heavenly Father so that you can find out what He wants. You hear that? <laughs> Prayer isn't about getting to God to do what you want. It's about you getting to know God so that you can do what he wants. Don't you think that's what Jesus was all about when he was praying? Don't you think that's what this whole passage is about? Is He's up there praying and God realizes he's, he's struggling. A, few, a little bit later, he's praying in the garden. Father, <laughs> If there's any other way, let this cup pass. But some of the most important words of the Scripture say, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus even gave us a pattern. Everybody say pattern. <laughs> pattern for prayer. You can look it up in Matthew chapter 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. That's somebody that's an authority figure. That's somebody that's higher than us. That's somebody that we submit ourselves to. That's somebody that we rely on for provision. It's putting the first things first and saying, our Father, who art in heaven, he's not here. One of the biggest things that pastors have struggles getting people to understand, it's not about you and it's not about now. It's about your whole eternity and being a part of his heavenly kingdom. There's a bigger picture that's going on. And yes, there is a heaven. It's not fully consummated. In Revelation 21, it tells us that, that heaven and earth are going to come together. And then it's going to be finalized and everything's going to be even better than we imagined or dreamed. But our Father is already there in heaven. Hallowed, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be. You know what my problem with Christians is? is some people don't feel like they've been to church unless they've said the Lord's Prayer. Our Heavenly Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Forgive us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. You think God likes it when we do it that way? Now, I'm praying for osmosis that if you keep saying it enough, you'll actually get it. But sometimes we struggle with forgiveness. And yet, if you read the full context, at the end of that prayer, it says, for if you do not forgive your fellow man, then neither will God forgive you. It's like, what? That's not good news. I don't, I don't need to hear that. I want all about that forgiveness up there. And so many times, we're not even paying attention to the prayer. But look at the pattern. How would be your name? God is to be put up front. Now, give us this day our daily bread. It's okay to pray for your needs. Now, listen to this. You're not surprising God in any way when you tell him what you need. 
because God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He already knows what you need. He's just waiting for you to come to him. You have not because you ask not. Or, so we need to ask, but we also have to ask with the right motives so that we can say, not my will, but your will be done. Prayer changes everything. Jesus gave us the pattern by constantly going away to pray. I want to ask you to think about it just for a moment. How would it change your life if you really developed an on-fire personal relationship with our Heavenly Father by just opening yourself up to Him and saying, My God, my Heavenly Father, holy is your name. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring for me. Thank you for, most of us just hit the grocery list. Okay, God, here's what I need today. I need a car. I need a provision. I need health concerns. I got this. I got this. And the, and the, by the time you're done, you and God are exhausted. He already knows all these things. But prayer changes everything. It changes us. It changes our personalities. It changes our attitudes. It changes, listen to this, our marriages. How many of you would like, don't raise your hand, please, if you're sitting with your spouse. How many of you would like a better marriage is to come to them and, and lift them up in prayer. But also the most important thing is God changes the way you perceive your marriage, your relationships, your church. Please don't raise your hand. How many of you would like a better church? How many of you, <laughs> that, yes, yeah. How many of you like a better pastor? Uh, trick, que trick question, trick question, yeah. But yeah. They say the best thing you could do is if you don't like your pastor is to pray for him. One of two things, he'll either, he'll either get better or two, God will pick him up and move him somewhere else. Okay, so just, just pray for your pastor. That was funny, people. Come on. Just, all right. Yeah. So, but I want you to think about this. I don't want you to, to shy away from asking for bold things. Peter got to walk on water for a little bit. Because he said, Lord, if it's really you, I want to come out of this boat. I want to walk on water. And yes, we all remember that he sank. But we forget is he actually walked on water for a little while through the power of Jesus. These two men that were with him, Moses, one of the incredible prayers of all history, right? Because through, through Moses, all the ten plagues happened. He got to get the uh, Israelites out of Egypt. He got to cross the Red Sea on dry land. I give me that stick. I want that staff that he raised up and said, whoosh, and the waters parted. And then while he went up on the mountain to pray, all the Israelites were forgetting exactly what God had just done for them, came out with a golden calf, and Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and says, what? What are you guys doing? Are you kidding me? Are you crazy? And even in Exodus, it tells us that Moses prayed for his people and God relented. God changed his mind about what he was going to do. Moses was an incredible power prayer. He prayed for food. He got manna. He got quail. So much quail that it I love the way it's descriptive here in the scriptures. It says it had, they had so much quail it was coming out of their what? Anybody remember? Nostrils. I mean, that's a lot of quail. When you, you go from being starving, you don't have any meat to eat. Why didn't we just stay in Egypt? Why didn't just God just kill us out in the desert? Why did he have to drag us out here? We could have died somewhere in more comfort. And he says, you want meat? I'll give you meat. Here's quail. So much so it's overflowing. They're out in the desert. There are no water fountains. There are no, no vending machines. And he needs something to drink. The people need something to drink. And God says, strike the rock. He strikes the rock and water comes gushing out of a desert. Don't be afraid to pray powerful prayers because God is on your side. He knows what you need. Elijah is one of my favorite. He comes in and he's, and he's uh, prophesying against the prophets of Baal. And then they, they have a fire making contest and he lets the 400 prophets of Baal go first. And then he gets his together. He gets his altar together. He puts his wood on it. And then what does he do? Crazy man that he is, he pours water all over it. And he said, now you know that when fire comes down, it comes from the one and only true heavenly father, but the only one God. And he prays and fire comes from heaven. 
and burns up everything, including all of the water. How cool is that? And then when he's tired, and he's tired of the people, and he's tired of running, and he's tired of being, wanting to be killed, he just wants to go home. He's just like, God, beam me up. I'm tired. I've done my job. I don't want to do this anymore. He's out in the desert. God gets a raven to bring him bread and water so that he might be refreshed and sustained. Incredible things have happened through these people. And then when he does die, he's taken up in a chariot. Are you kidding me? How many of you just like to skip the whole dying process and let you know, hey, send that golden chariot down. I'd just like to take a ride right on up to heaven. I don't, I don't, I, I, well, let me say this about the, the whole rapture thing. A lot of people believe it. A lot of people don't. I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm trying to figure it out. I can see where they get it from. And yet I, I, we don't base it off one thing. But, if you, but I kind of hope it's cool. I mean, I hope it's there. I hope it's real. Because if they're going to beam me up that way, I just want to start flying. I just, when Jesus comes back, it's like the heavens open up, the trumpets are sounding, and we just start going, whoo, I've always wanted to fly. Wouldn't that be cool? That's what God can do through us, through the power of prayer. I want to ask you, have you seen God working in your lives this week? Could be through the movies. Could be through the TV. It could be through nature. It could be through other people. It could be through the power of prayer. I want you to remember this this morning, that, that God knows you. He loves you. He understands the struggles that you're going through. Even when you're hungry, you're desperate to try to find him, to hear from him, and I believe he will answer you. Not always in your timing, not always in your will, not always in your way, but he does give us his answers. But most important is God is waiting for us to come to kneel by our bedside, to get up early in the morning, to pray as we're going to sleep so that we can hear from him, that we can have an intimate relationship with him, that we can get to know him so that we know how to live our lives now and forevermore.